Tonight, Agape Latte is proud to present Sheila McMahon, Director of Women's Resource Center here at Boston College. Um, Sheila completed her Master of Divinity from Harvard University in 2002, where she studied feminist ethics and liberation theology. She's a BC grad, class of 98. She majored in English and Women's Studies, and she worked at the WRC from 1995 to 1998. After graduating, she did JVC Southwest and being ruined for life, by JVC. She has held a number of, of social justice oriented jobs before returning to BC in 06 to direct the Women's Resource Center. She's been an invaluable asset to the entire BC community. She's from Keene, New Hampshire and proudly wants everyone to know it is the home of Pumpkin Fest. Um, she'll be speaking tonight on uncertainty within the life of faith. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to the incomparable Sheila McMahon. That's a very nice introduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I know from just talking with students on my staff that it is an incredibly busy time of year and also there's about six million things happening on campus tonight. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Thank you to Rick and Campus Ministry, C21, and also the Dining Services folks who I, I was in the back practicing my talk and they were moving around doing lots of work. So thank you for the gift of being here. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Is the first question. Okay, great. So as Megan said, thank you, uh, the va my conversation tonight with you is about the value of uncertainty in a life of faith. And I can tell you that from the time of my Catholic elementary school entrance exam, where we were provided with big red pencils without erasers, to my graduation from the hallowed halls of Harvard University's Divinity School, I learned and learned again that there are some words and phrases that are so inappropriate, so downright embarrassing, that they should never be uttered aloud, especially in polite company. Do you want to hear them? Okay. okay. So, here goes. The phrases include, I'm not sure. I don't understand. Maybe. And the big one, I don't know. Especially in Div School, admitting you didn't know something, that you were uncertain, was paramount to scholastic and often social Harry Carey. So according to the dictionary, the denotation of uncertainty is very simple. It's doubt, the state of being unsure of something. However, when I think about what it means to be uncertain about something, standing here in front of all of you, my own connotation of uncertainty the story I tell myself about what uncertainty actually means involves not knowing the answer, with a capital A. In short, uncertainty is not knowing and feeling kind of bad about it. Looking inward, I've often viewed uncertainty as akin to a kind of chronic illness. There it is again, something to be hidden, to be overcome. Uncertainty often equals imperfection a supposed external sign of an internal condition indicating that we don't quite measure up. And yet, because uncertainty has been a central aspect of my own experience, particularly as a lay Catholic woman who struggles with questions about ordination and its consequences, and is one who wrestles daily with what it means to live out the gospel message, to be not afraid, I've come to see that uncertainty is actually an opportunity for God's grace to unfold before one's very eyes. I'll get back to this last point. But first, uncertainty itself. What does one do in the face of uncertainty? In myself, I have had the painful experience of realizing that my own tendency is to stuff it. My discomfort about not knowing something often triggers my automatic pilot. I end up having conversations in which I'm so busy trying not to reveal my ignorance on a topic, trying to subdue the burn of uncertainty rising in my chest, that I can actually miss what the other person is saying. And I miss out on an opportunity to learn something new. Sometimes when I'm uncertain and trying to be something, anything else, I miss you entirely. In contrast, acknowledging I don't know invites us to be vulnerable to each other in surprising ways that have the potential to spark intimacy, 
closeness, and true friendship. And I'll say more about that later. I've found that in other people, uncertainty is often undetectable. It sometimes masquerades as indifference or even superiority. You may notice this in some of your classes. When the professor asks a question and all eyes begin scanning the floor, because we're sort of unwilling to admit that we're really uncertain about the question at hand. And of course, to add insult to anxiety, this searching is ultimately relieved by some person or other who, in the intervening moments of collective uncertainty, and some may even say panic, has casually flipped to the textbook glossary or logged onto his or her laptop to get the capital A answer from Wikipedia. She often does so with an appearance of calm, emotional armor securely in place, although maybe she hasn't even done the reading either, or really engaged with any of the questions that are pertinent to the course that you're in together. It calls to mind for me an experience I had of once having a 45-minute conversation with a classmate of mine at Harvard who was critiquing uh, Toni Morrison's very beautiful book, Beloved, and sort of berating my interest in it, when a few of the comments he made didn't quite strike me as making a whole lot of sense, and I asked him about this point and pressed um, further until he finally acknowledged that he'd never actually read the book, but he did a really good job for those 45 minutes, um, making me feel like I, I wasn't so sure about what we were talking about. So I laugh at my classmate, but the reality is it's a persistent and shared habit, this way of responding to uncertainty, the quiet annihilation of unfamiliar details, the tendency to sort of trivialize what's unknown and just run the droning vacuum of certitude over unasked questions. In her book, uh, Big Questions, Worthy Dreams, uh, developmental psychologist Sharon Parks discusses uncertainty, specifically in emerging adults, and that's most of you, um, who many of us spend a lot of time trying to understand. And she writes this, quote, uh, doubt may emerge in the form of increasing curiosity, a devastating shattering of assumptions, vague restlessness, intense weariness with things as they are, a body of broken expectations, interpersonal conflict, or the discovery of intellectual dissonance, end quote. It's a lot to take in. So because of that complexity, Park sort of explores and warns us that we can often, in the face of uncertainty, fall into a tendency of doing some academic sword play, like my classmate at Harvard, or becoming overwhelmed by anxiety. Facing our doubts, especially about God, as an isolated intellectual endeavor, as was sometimes the tendency of my teachers in the Jesus Seminar, only helps to prove how much we already know. Building intellectual and academic acumen this way helps us in short-term game. It gives us external approval, but it doesn't actually help us deepen our relationship with God. So then the question arises, how do we hold the gift of uncertainty with an open palm, without falling on our intellectual swords or becoming overwhelmed by anxiety? In her writing, Parks reflects that uncertainty can lead us to ask honest and open questions. My friend Rob, who is a very proud uh, BC double eagle, have, was raised Jewish. And he would often remark to me that in his experience growing up Jewish, asking questions was actually considered a form of prayer. For those of us raised to believe that asking questions is impolite, this vision of inquiry, asking questions as prayer, can be illuminating and freeing. Questions we ask of ourselves and God, with the same humility and attentiveness as other forms of prayer, present one important way forward with our uncertainty. It may also help us to relax into our uncertainty when we remember God as what I believe Father Himes calls the ineffable mystery. When it comes to God, we simply cannot know all there is to know, nor do we need to. Writing from a Christian perspective, a team of my colleagues here at BC have observed, quote, Christian theology claims more, that in Jesus of Nazareth, God chose to become a human being. If absolute mystery is human, whatever makes us more fully human makes us more like this mystery, end quote. I would argue that nothing is more human than being unsure, and the act of allowing and even welcoming uncertainty can bring us into closer connection with God. 
When we're open to our own uncertainty about who God is or where God is leading us, we actually free ourselves to enter into deepening relationship with the divine. This is a relationship that requires us to bring our true selves to the fore, because authenticity is a necessary antecedent to intimacy. Being authentically who we are allows us to say to God, beyond my Ugg boots, beyond my North Face jacket, beyond my long list of Facebook friends, even beyond my hard-won victories on the field or in the classroom, here I am. Just me, without the status I use as camouflage to protect me from revealing the depths of my vulnerability. I am here, O oh God, because I need you and I belong to you. It's here in this place, unencumbered by roles and expectations, that we have the freedom to meet God anew, to allow the mystery of God's active presence into our lives more fully. So one of the questions I hope we'll be able to explore further tonight is what allows us to continue to lean into this kind of spiritual uncertainty, to be vulnerable and open to really knowing God's love for us more fully. Our Buddhist friends teach us that the two wings that make the proverbial bird, that would be us, fly, are compassionate aware, awareness and allowing. Allowing, in this case, the discomfort of uncertainty to move through us. This means grounding ourselves in our lived experience and most centrally in our bodies. Discussing things like making ourselves vulnerable, accepting our doubts, can leave us with our shoulders up by our ears, holding our breath. Teachers like Buddhist Tara Brach remind us to breathe, to allow into awareness the full range of feelings that we experience. This non-judgmental allowing is a way into prayer, into conversation with the Holy One. Father Thomas Keating, who's a Trappist monk, known for his teaching of centering prayer, would describe this allowing as an opportunity to be awake, to consent to the feelings of worthlessness or disappointment that can often accompany uncertainty. Consenting to these feelings that may arise when we become still is to be more fully present for the experience of incredible freedom that lies beyond the painful feelings. As we take this courageous step to let uncertainty about who God is for us into our lives, it also helps to have a viable community of belonging. This includes, in halftime speak, conversation partners, roommates, friends, cure groups, faculty, staff, people who can offer support and lovingly challenge us. Other things that can nourish our spirit as we go forward in uncertainty are things like opportunities for communal worship, time for personal reflection, possibly a spiritual director, definitely serving others, and of course, a damn good sense of humor. In my experience, it is allowing ourselves to be vulnerable to ask questions when we're not sure, to invite God and one another into the complexity, the messiness, and the incredible beauty that constitutes our faith lives and spiritual journeys, that it's then that we can really experience the gift of uncertainty most completely. So I'd like to close my remarks and open up time for conversation with a prayer by another Trappist monk, I love the Trappists, I guess, uh, Thomas Merton, who many of you may have read before, who was very lovingly open about the uncertainties he faced in his faith life. And Merton writes, My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road though I may know nothing about it. 
Therefore will I trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. So if anybody has any questions for Sheila, I have the mic right here. Raise your hand and I can come pass it around. Anybody right now? Back there. All right. Thanks, Steve. Great job, Sheila. Thanks, Bobby. Um, can you speak <laughs> Thanks to... Thanks for coming. Oh, no problem. Can you speak <laughs> to the idea of service as a way of combating the uncertainty about your faith and maybe uh, realizing that faith in a, a new way? Yeah, I, I will say to you that um, a lot of what I learned about doing service, I learned in some ways first here at BC. Um, not that it was not something part of my life before then, but um, I think the way that BC as a community would talk about service was in some ways very different. I grew up in a, as Rick was saying, in Keene, New Hampshire, in a sort of lower middle class, poorer uh, community. So when I did, for example, Appalachia Volunteers, um, when I was a student at BC as an undergrad, in some regards I actually had more in common with the people I was serving in New Road, Virginia, than I did with my classmates who were accompanying me. And so it took me a long time both to sort of um, move through that and, and understand that a little bit better, and also that, as I mentioned, and Megan mentioned in the introduction, after graduate school, I spent some time working out in uh, Los Angeles, and I helped to run a statewide anti-poverty initiative um, for the California State Senate. And I also spent some time working very closely with an interfaith peace group. And it was fascinating, particularly with the peace group, um, to sit around the table with people who were ministers and rabbis and nuns and priests, um, and to realize that people who were doing the, the work that they were doing in the community sometimes were so focused on that external peace that the way that they actually treated one another didn't reflect the ethos that they wanted to see in the world, right? So they were working for peace and justice, but in those interpersonal relationships, right, what was actually happening was that very hurtful behaviors um, and long-standing issues around systemic racism and issues about class were reenacted. And so what I took away from that experience was that service is critical right? it's to, to a life of faith because it helps us to encounter God and to move in ways that move us beyond our comfort zone. And at the same time, what's so critical in that process of moving outward is also to have some time and space to move more deeply inward. And this is one of the things, um, the young woman who was talking about JVC, that I think some of the folks I worked with in JVC did, in the Judgment Volunteer Corps did very well. Um, but that holding those two pieces, especially when you're in an environment where a political landscape, where things are changing quickly, where you're working in a nonprofit setting, where there's very limited resources, it really takes a lot of courage to say, you know, yes, I want to do this external work in the world but at the same time to hold that internal space and to continue to do the internal work that's a necessary precursor to that external work. Make sense? Okay, thanks for your question, Bobby. And I, have, I have a question if no one Good. else is right Go now. For it, I'm gonna play devil's advocate and say, Please do. if everything, uh, the value of uncertainty is obviously very high and that's the point of this talk tonight, but <laughs> in all those kind of vehicles where you can come together and you know, so through service groups or cure groups or all kind of groups on campus where people come together who are uncertain, when is it okay to try and say, you know, we all are outside of our comfort zone and feeling vulnerable to try and reach towards certainty, to try and, you know, discern something about something else that everyone come together, does that make sense at all? Mm -hmm. When does that kind of come into play as kind of a common goal of people who are uncertain to try and move towards something more tangible? That's a great question. Uh, in my, my own experience of it is that it's sort of a, I can, my, one of my housemates is here, we go salsa dancing together. And when you salsa dance, right, you, you can dance with a lot of different people. Um, but each time you dance with someone, it's a slightly different experience, right? You know the steps, you know the moves, but it's always just a little bit, a little bit different. <laughs> sometimes better, sometimes worse, but we won't get into that. Um, different. And I think that similarly, your question is, is a good one. I think um, there's, it, it is in a, a sense a dance, right? Because there are moments, I think, for all of us when 
Like there are times when I stand at Mass, you know, after I haven't been to Mass in a long time, and particularly um, funerals. In like my family, we've had several in recent years, and there is something about the incredible certainty and familiarity of the rituals that we go through together that has not just profound meaning in sort of an esoteric sense, but that I can literally feel internally, or I was talking about, you know, grounding yourself in your body, I can feel that, that change to a place of feeling centered and feeling connected with, with the divine. Um, so, so I do think that that, that it is important. I think the challenge is that when we feel that comfort, to t have that solace, to have the consolation, and then not to um, allow that to become so still that it, it becomes stagnant and, and that question of boundaries and sort of how do we still, you know, how, to live the gospel, to, to live in a way that constantly challenges us to be countercultural in our, in our lifestyle and in our choices. Um, we need to sort of have that movement between the comfort and the consolation and also the desolation and the challenges. It's a great question. Um, do you have any advice as to how to help someone else who's struggling with uncertainty in their faith life? Yeah. Um, my experience of often being a person who's uncertain to my faith life and having people around me who are very loving, I think um, for me it goes back to the piece, like I was talking about with the Buddhists, um, being non-judgmental is, is a huge gift that we can give, not just to ourselves, but to other people. I think that... Um, Sometimes there's, as I mentioned, people I think particularly who are uncertain or unsure can feel a lot of very intense feelings, right? That they can feel anger, they can feel confusion, disappointment, rejection. Um, and to the extent to which we can model for them that we can tolerate that level of discomfort, um, I think that that helps people to relax and say, okay, this, this close friend of mine is walking with me on this journey and she's not troubled by the fact that I'm having a hard time. And I think that that opens a lot of space. And that once we sort of have established that, um, that it's a non, to be a non-judgmental presence to each other, it also then opens the opportunity for us to um, very gently make some suggestions. Not, not attached to the outcome, right? Because people will do whatever they're going to do, and that's okay. Um, but to be able to make suggestions about, you know, I've tried this kind of prayer, or I've gone to see, you know, Father Jack, and this was my experience. Um, I've, you know, done the Sunday Mass, and that's really helped me. To, to weave those into a conversation with someone once they have um, a sense that they can trust us, because we're not going to judge them uh, for not being sort of perfect in their faith, I think that goes a long way. Yeah, it's a great question. Is there ever a point um, when uncertainty is no longer a part of your faith life uh, to be embraced, but it becomes a problem in your faith life? Yeah, it's funny. There was uh, I was reading, I think it was the Globe, it was the Times, last week, and it was somebody from um, Obama's, I think it was, uh, what's his name? The guy who's going to be his chief of staff, was talking about the economic downturn. And he said, you know, a crisis is an opportunity never to be missed. <laughs> really? Wow. You know, like we're looking at some major, you know, economic problems, not just in the U.S., but in the worldwide market. And this guy is, you know, he's not afraid to be quoted on a national, you know, well-respected newspaper saying, it's all in how you look at it, right? And I, I think, too, in, in Chinese, is it the character for crisis is also the character for opportunity. So, so I think it can be a problem in the sense that it may... Um, cause us to contract, to be unwilling to, to engage, to explore, to, um, to continue to seek God. But at the same time, I think it's also a matter of perspective. And so is it a, is it a problem or is it an opportunity? You know, is it a challenge or is it a gift? And sometimes that change in perspective um, can help us move forward. Hey, Charlie. <laughs> um, I know, um, to use Carrie Cronin terminology, a lot of my faith life here has been kind of in this peak experience environment, 
um, which BC cultivates so well. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about how to continue a faith life when you know you're no longer going to have that kind of peak experience to keep um, rejuvenating your faith when you start to become more and more uncertain. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's an ongoing challenge. And again, I mentioned one of my housemates is here. And I, I will say, as a person who doesn't have a family, a spouse or children, living in community has actually been a huge um, source of sort of um, strength and light around questions about how to continue asking and exploring. Um, I think it helps to talk to people. And when you live with people that you feel comfortable talking to, um, that's a way to sort of get some of those questions out on the table to be able to continue that faith journey especially in places where it starts to feel really barren. You're right, it's, and, and Carrie's right, it's a, it's a real challenge, I would say, beyond these gates. But it's also, again, back to our friend's question, a challenge, also an opportunity um, to be creative about what that looks like. Yeah. And I think, again, JVC, I feel like I'm giving my like commercial for JVC, but um, JVC, again, I think it, it, because of the community living component and the spirituality component, to kind of have provide sort of some tracks, like, you know, on a railroad to kind of keep the car moving forward, um, so to speak, to think about, okay, what might this look like in community outside of college? But I would also encourage you while you're here, especially for the undergrads, to take the time, especially with your roommates and, in, like I said, cure groups or other friends that you feel comfortable with, to have some of those conversations and to ask each other that very question and to see what emerges. I think people come up with some pretty creative solutions when you talk to each other. Pretty bright crowd, PC students. Really. I was. Do you, okay, oh, do you want to answer? I'll oh, go ahead, Karen. Sheila, I liked your idea about being creative, and, and it's interesting your point about having a peak experience at BC because I had gone here years ago, and um. And when I, I left and then I lived closer, I could still go to St. Ignatius and still be part of that community and still be part of the BC community. But then when your life changes and you move on and you try to find that sense of, of um, peace and, and spirituality in different parishes, we were driving all over the place just trying to find what we were thirsting for, even to the point that we were commuting to St. Ignatius from you know 40 minutes. But then you have to be creative and you have to find ways to reach out and for our family it was that service piece that made us feel like maybe that will help us find our way back and, and, and get that same feeling that we had when we were here and um and that's what seemed to work and then we came back <laughs> yeah but <laughs> yeah and that's something i have to say having spent some time with um, some Buddhist folks, you know, they're really good about saying, you know, their logic is sort of inductive, and it's like you try it, and if it doesn't work, you don't do it. You do something else. And I think that that's a real gift um, when you think about, you know, being in conversations with people from other faith traditions. It's sometimes really helpful to have somebody say, oh, yeah, I don't do that because it doesn't work. It's like, really? You don't? <laughs> you know? So I, I think your point is well taken, Karen. Yeah, finding that place where you really feel nourished um, so that you can connect with the divine, right? So that you can bring your best and truest self. You know, the, the world needs you. The world needs you to be most fully who you are. And whatever helps you do that. Um, as long as it doesn't harm you or someone else, which I, I don't think it would by virtue of the, the nature of it, um, do it. Yeah. I was curious too, from, just from all of you, if people had um, or would, would be willing to say, you know, what are things that help you in your lives to lean into uncertainty in faith? What are the things that maybe you do or the people that you talk to? So is that asking the questions or, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. Anything else people do? Um, Thanks, you. Should I start over, I guess? Uh, mm -hmm. So um, when I was in high school, I thought it was, you know, it was hard, like, in the, like, busy, I don't know, school week and stuff to like really think about these questions and stuff. But I, <clears throat> my high school did a really good job. I went to a Catholic high school and they did a good job of like retreats and encouraging people to get on retreats. And I don't know, that always like 
kind of like, like like you've been saying, being in a community atmosphere, like an atmosphere that's like spiritual, like that. To like really think about those questions, that always helped me to kind of like, I don't know, like look at the questions, and then I I would be uncertain for a little while, but then I you know no, I would come back to it. So that was always good for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that community piece is so key. And also something else you mentioned, too, I think the time piece. I've done, um, you know, campus ministry coordinates the busy student retreats a couple times a year, which some of you may have done. And one of the things that I always find fascinating is sometimes students will say, you know, I haven't had time in my week to do, you know, this reading this Bible passage or to read the, um, you know, poem or reflection that I was given. And, and, I, and I, I'm absolutely sympathetic to that and also want to push back and say, as you're coming into more complete adulthood, right, how do we sort of make that shift? Like you're talking about, I think, you know, that high school is such a formative time and people are really helping to provide that structure. And in some ways, as Carly was saying, BC can continue to do that as an institution. But then how do we also start practicing making that a priority for ourselves? Because I think the way that we are when we're young can, can, tends to continue with us. It's hard to, you know, it's like people talk about the hookup culture, you know, and, you know, it's, it's good, bad, and different, whatever. But the bottom line being, you know, it's not like you flip a switch on May 19th, you know, of your commencement year and suddenly go out into the world and it's like, you know, how to date. I mean, dating's a little, it's, it's complicated. There's rules. <laughs> I won't get into it. But, but the bottom line being, you know, it, it takes some practice, right, to sort of be good at it. Um, so in the same way with questions around faith, and particularly when we feel uncertain, this is a place to kind of practice, right? You get some, you got a little elbow room, you're sort of on your own, and you're free. There's enough, like Carly was saying, some really beautiful traditions and resources that the university makes available. But also I would encourage people to strike out and, and, and explore what is this going to look like for me, not just today, but, you know, in, in five or ten years from now. What am I doing for myself to cultivate a practice that helps me feel connected? Yeah, thank you. Other things people do? Can you say something, Joseph? I, I wanted to ask you, um, in comparison to today, when you were here, and between, I think you said 95 and 98, yeah. what, what was something you would tell um, someone on one of your mission trips when they asked you, in comparison to what you would say today, if someone asked you, um, lower middle class, lower class, poverty stricken, um, on JVC trips, I'm not sure if you interact with people who have... Uh, experienced things like Katrina and other mm -hmm. ca catastrophes what would you how would you respond if somebody asked you where where is your God um, then and how would you respond today with the question where is this God of yours in the world yeah, yeah I would say that, that that question the answer my answer to that question probably has not changed a whole lot in the intervening decade and plus um, when I was in JVC, I, I worked, spent a lot of time in the emergency room because I would meet um, rape survivors who needed to get rape kits done, which were sort of a medical exam and evidence collection off of their bodies in the event that they were going to press charges against the perpetrator. So, you, you know, you could get college students, you could be prostitutes, there could be, you know, teenage kids. You never knew who you were going to meet, but, but the commonality was that they were all in a lot of pain, and not just physical pain, but, but spiritual and emotional pain. And I love the... Um, story, and I think it's Elie Wiesel who, who retells this, about being, I think, in Auschwitz, actually, um, in a concentration camp, and someone, you know, sees this man who's suffering, deeply, deeply suffering at the hands of the soldiers, and, you know, set, asked that very question, you know, where is um, that God of yours now? And, and his answer in that moment of just absolute terror and suffering is right here with me. And I think, um, especially you know, this time of year, thinking about Advent, um, Emmanuel, you know, God with us. And, and I, I think that that, um, that probably, for me, has not changed a whole lot. So I would probably give that same answer 10 years ago that I would give today. It's a, it's a great question, important question, hard question. Um, just to go back to your question about like what do people do at BC, yeah. um, as a student who was really not religiously involved for my first two years, I'm just thinking about your, um, your statement like don't do what doesn't work. 
And I know um, I had a lot of expectations either on my family members or other people around me to kind of dictate like what was normal for faith life. And I found that it wasn't until I stopped expecting other people to fill in my faith life and to proactively go find somebody who I could talk to about it or go to a community where people were already doing this. Um, you know, like there's a Bono quote I really like that says, stop ask God to, asking God to bless what you're doing. Go do what bl God, God wants you to do because it's already mm -hmm. blessed. And it's kind of that idea of like stop waiting it to come for it to come to you. Because I know like I don't talk to my parents about faith. If I talk to my sister about faith, like she kind of laughs at me. That doesn't mean it's not valid. It's just don't look to those people for affirmation if they're not giving you the affirmation you crave. Like go to someone who's going to give it to you. And so I know for me it's been a lot about like being proactive about it and not waiting for it to come to me because I'm not going to find it unless I try. Yeah, I think that's a great attitude. There's a one, I have a teacher, a um, woman named Byron Katie, and she always says, you know, God, or one of her prayers, you know, is God spare us from the desire for love, approval, or appreciation. And I think she's talking exactly to what you're saying, Carly. It's like, it's pro it may never come. And one of my favorite you know, tales of this is deciding to do JVC. And I can remember being in the car, you know, and gripping the steering wheel and just saying, you know, God, I've got $300 in my bank account, but I will tell you on my, you know, blood and the earth I'm standing on, I know that I'm supposed to go and do this. So please help me find the way. And deciding, yes, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to go to California and do a crisis work. And my father, um, of all people, this is a man who, you know, I grew up, we didn't watch Super Bowl. We watched the Democratic National Convention. I can tell you everything Mario Cuomo said, like in 84, you know. <laughs> anyway, I won't bore you with the details. But um, that, to that point of, you know, just that he was furious with me. You know, he threw, threw a laundry basket in my general direction. He was so upset that I was going to go and do this. And if I had waited, for his approval to say, well, Dad, you know, I think that God is calling me here, but I'll wait till you finish the tantrum with the laundry basket and, you know, a few years hence, and then I'll do it. No, it's doing it and saying, this is where I really feel called. And of course, in, in that, the footnote to that particular story is that five years later, I was in my parents' house. I could hear my dad, like myself, as a very loud phone talker, and he was talking to a family friend, and he was saying, oh, Tucker, don't worry, she's going to be fine. It's a great program, and he's going on, and I realized he's talking about JBC, and he's telling him, you know, he's making it sound like it was his idea, you know, that I went and did it, so, you know, you never know what kind of transformation, when you have the courage, you know, to do it for yourself, the impact that that actually can have on the people that you love, it's kind of cool. Any other questions or thoughts? Ways you lean into uncertainty? Sorry, being, ta being conscious of time, I want to yes. wrap up soon. I'm going to uh, be the final Ooh, yeah, uh, kind of comment question. Go for it. Uh, what stood out, one of the things that stood out to me a lot with uh, what you're talking about is a need for community and, and support around uncertainty. And I know that was, uh, is uh, the case for me. I, you know, my upbringing uh, religiously was very much from a place of certainty. You know, the answers are in the Bible. Here you go, blah blah blah. Um, and so for me uh, to to oh, I, uh, went to school for pastoral ministry eventually, and and to to learn even in Christology the question of what did Jesus know and when did he know it that there was even on the cross some sense of doubt possibly even in Jesus. There's a legitimate question there. Hmm. Even that uncertainty. Uh, not something that I could bring back to what had been my major place of uh, spiritual support in my family and uh, ended up finding that elsewhere. Th that seems to be key to me, that when we have our own uncertainties and move through them and, and you know, like you said, do the dance between the two, uh, we need that sense of support and that can come from so many different places and we need to be aware of where it's not as well, like you were saying, and don't go back there. Um, so two things <coughs> is... Uh, could you describe any experiences yourself of that communal support? You did mention, but uh, reiterate maybe communal support uh, around that. Uh, number one. Number two is it seems to me that you mentioned living in community. Uh, I may be wrong. My sense is that's a bit countercultural. That's not the first thing that people know about or, or hear about is I'm going to go live in, in community and what that means. Describing what it is for you, how you came to it, to the extent that, that you might want to, just to kind of flesh that out a little more, and, and what does that mean, because it is so valuable and, and, and so important. So communal living, what was the first part? I don't even, I, don't, I forget. <laughs> uh, uh, experiences of um, uh, community support around uncertainty, not necessarily just in living in community, but in, in kind of developmental 
stages. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's funny, if you, if you are f folks who are Kairos uh, veterans, have, and many others may have also done life graphs, you know, and I would say, um, in my, when I was, I was doing a life graph a number of years ago, it, when the first Kairos I went on, and um, the community support piece, it, it was interesting just to see in all the places in my life where there was a lot of sort of, you know, on the low end of the graph, things were really tough. Um, not only was God very present, but there were, there were people all along the way who really made an, an impact on me. And one of those sort of communities I can think of is just, again, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, you know, being um, Catholic and a woman um, and being in divinity school with other women who are going to be ordained, who, and other, who have gone on to be ordained in other faith traditions who are friends of mine, was an incredible gift for me because prior to that experience I couldn't even I didn't even have in in the framework of my imagination a vision of what it would look like to be a woman who was ordained and so to be in that community of women who were going through that process and sharing their own challenges and, and uncertainties as they, as they as they moved through the ordination process but who also um, looked at me and said, well, you know, you, you could do that if you wanted to. And it was like a huge revolution for me because I just had never, I didn't, I didn't grow up with the experience of women on the altar. Um, so that, that would be, I think, an example. And I think that community support has, has carried all along the way. Um, and the communal living, you know, it's funny, I just, um, we have dinner together as a house. There are six of us on Sunday nights. And I recently had a date, uh, which is very nice, um, who... <laughs> <laughs> who came to the house with me, <laughs> lots of practice, um, for dinner. And I was showing him the pictures. The, the house has been in one form or another in existence as a group for like you know, nine or ten years. Yeah, ten years this year, right? Um, and I haven't always been part of it, but um, it's been there. And he was kind of, you know, sort of puzzled about like, you know, wh why were people there and why would they leave? And um, I had had dinner previously at his place and he is a bachelor lives by himself and um i said to him but don't don't you see it it's like it's so palpable even just when you walk into the space you know it's this sense of um of companionship of solidarity of of joyfulness of people who are um moving through the world in their own way and yet who are making space for for you know you and your own experience and you, know, you want to do the same for them um I mean, it's certainly an, an, an antidote to and an sort of a way of not just um, not just addressing loneliness per se, but of really knowing that when I go home, it's okay for me to bring all of myself, and that someone is going to be there to rec to receive it. Um, and that, that's a, that's been a very powerful experience. Yeah, and I know for people who are um, the unindoctrinated, the non JVCers. <laughs> it can seem a little bit strange, but it, in some ways, it's actually. I grew up in a big family, and it's not. In, in some ways, it's not unlike that. Um, so I, I definitely recommend it. And I think there's something really wonderful in, as you move on from BC. You know, I, I've had other roommate situations. I've I was engaged for a while, and I lived with my former fiance. Um, and and that sense of um, you know, I think it's very American, like, you know, this is mine, that's yours, keep the boundaries, everybody back off, there's six bottles of milk in the fridge, because everyone has to have their own, and it's like, we could, we can live that way, but is that really the way that we want to live, or that we're called to live, or that we feel most fully alive? Um, and so, it, for me, it's, it's very life-giving. Yeah. I recommend it. Is that good? Is that enough? Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it.